Welcome to episode number six of Colorado Tech. Do you live in the Colorado area and into technology startups? Want the inside scoop? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Colorado Tech Cast with your host, Trapper Little. Hey everybody, Trapper here. Colorado Tech Cast brings you interviews with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and technology pioneers from across the state. We provide a behind the scenes look at who's doing what, why, and how you can get involved. Join us each episode to hear the exciting stories of technology happenings in our state. In this episode, I interview Peter Melby, co-founder and CEO of Greystone Technology. Peter founded Greystone in 2001 when he realized that success in the technology business was about more than the ones and zeros. Averaging 40% year-over-year growth for the past 12 straight years, Greystone has figured out how to do something that many technology support companies haven't, that is, have authentic conversations, and make IT a people-first endeavor. Peter talks about starting out at age 20, how his management style has evolved, and how he intentionally creates a culture of openness. Now let's get started. Peter started Greystone Technology in 2001, right after the dot-com boom and bust, and an ideal time uh, to start a technology company, wouldn't you say, Peter? (laughs) Yeah, you know those uh, those early days are a little bit blurry. I think that um, one of the things that we we came to find pretty quickly is that uh, if if you provide the right value, there's really no wrong time to start a technology company because just because of the the tech boom and bust um, didn't mean that businesses weren't using tech. So um, we were less focused on trying to bring a specific niche product to market and more focused on how do we bridge you know, some of the gaps in the business technology space that we had uh, seen you know, it, in those, those early years of people having computers you know, at every desk in their office for the first time. So what led you to start the company? So I, I, in 2001, I, I was 20. So I, I can't say that it was this this really big, you know, ambitious. We're going to come, come out and change the world uh, type vision. I had an outsourced IT job in high school. Um, I met Jesse Armstrong, my partner at that job, and he was in college at the time. He graduated, and we we, we just really connected over the idea that the the common experience for most people when it came to using technology at work and getting support for that technology at work uh, wasn't sustainable and wasn't something that people really looked at as a positive uh, experience. So back in the early days, I... I had a, you know, they, they hired me at this company. I was 16, 17. Um, and they basically said, all right, you can pay attention to what we do. You can learn things on the sideline, but we don't actually want you doing much work. So we, we had a key contract at a municipality at City Hall. There was a contracted position that uh, went vacant very suddenly. And so they asked me, they said, all right, we need you to go sit in that chair but don't do anything. <laughs> we just have to f- fulfill the contract. So when issues come up, uh, just call us and we'll get someone to fix the problem. But so I was basically just intended to be a liaison for a couple of weeks. I didn't leave that chair for a year and or a year and a half um, until I went off to college. So what I found during that time was that it didn't matter how much technology experience I had. Um, it didn't matter how much understanding I had of the ones and zeros. It didn't matter how old I was. It didn't matter how much career experience I had. If I could figure out what problems people were actually having and figure out the solutions to those problems, I was providing value. And as it turns out, the, the organization had their own IT department. But the IT department was so focused on the infrastructure and the technology itself that the the users got so fed up um, with the experience that they they banded together and outsourced paid for an outsourced solution just to get the experience of someone willing to understand and solve their problems. So it started us on a long journey of trying to understand why IT stereotypes were, were the way they are and what we could do to potentially change that and why people in our industry were so content with actually providing what we saw was a, a really subpar experience and subpar service. So that's what led us to the place of saying, okay, we can do this a little bit different. Now, like I said, I, I was 20. So in the early days, it was mostly just, you know, find some small businesses 
um, help them use technology better, give them someone that they can really rely on, you know, to be solutions architects, you know, tech support, help desk, all, all of that, you know, in one. But they're mostly very small organizations. Um, so it grew substantially gradually or consistently, I guess. Gradually might not be the right word um, because when we turn around – a few years ago, we realized we had averaged 40% growth a year for 12 straight years. And it really had nothing to do with anything more than continuing to figure out how to change the IT experience for people that really needed it to be to be different. You position yourself as a people-first company, right? So you're really investing in both your employees as well as your customers. Correct. Yeah, I think that it's... It, you know, uh, along that journey, we found that one of the big missing pieces was that uh, people who came into the IT industry often came into it because they wanted to work with machines. They wanted to work with things that were black and white. And to most of the population, um, IT and technology, um, especially the nuts and bolts of it, is, is confusing and difficult. But for engineering-minded and anal analytically-driven people, um, it's it's everything that they want. There are no gray areas. There is an absolute reason why something functions the way that it does, um, and it's our job to figure that out, and it's our job to fix that. The, the problem is that it's the people using the technology and people run the businesses. So back in the late 90s, it was very easy to start an, an IT service company because all you needed to know is how to fix the computers and how the computers worked. There was a shortage of that knowledge. So the industry, as it was built, really developed into something that was very self-focused and very self-serving. And you can see it even in today's you know, typical tech support structures. You know, you have your lowest end um, technicians on the front line delivery. So the first people, you know, the, the, the first person that gets a, you know, that, that takes a shot at, at fixing the problem is the least qualified, you know, and then it escalates up to tier one, tier two, tier three. And that's a, that's a model that is, it, it, it's, it's very common. It's very baked into a lot of, of how the industry runs, but in almost every other industry, you would think that that would, would be absurd. You wouldn't take your car, you know, if it was having a major engine problem to the, the guy that changes the oil and say, give it a shot. Best case scenario, it takes forever to get to the person that can fix it. Worst case scenario, it's irreparable by the time it gets there because of the tinkering, because of the, the lack of understanding of the, the core problem. And so what we found was that this gap and this, this, this lack of understanding of the people element of technology usage in business, even you know, in the early 2000s, was something that was just going to be missed by a lot of you know, the technology service providers. And we, I still remember in 2001, 2002, 2003, thinking we may have a couple of year head start on people before they figure out that IT really does have to be a people first endeavor. And, you know, 16 years later, I, I, I still think there are people who are, I mean, the, the most of the industry doesn't understand those concepts and is still trying to ar architect services that really just relate to how quickly can we fix the technology and how can we make it the most convenient for us. So how did you determine the market or the verticals that you wanted to first? So I think that uh, in the early days, it was um, that, that very special entrepreneurial vertical of anyone who's willing to give us money. <laughs> Never turned down a paycheck, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so we we recognized that um, bootstrapping this, being you know as as young as we were, and frankly, again, just kind of year after year, recalibrating our vision for for what we were doing, we wanted to pay our bills, and so we we very quickly found a niche um, in industries that were, had been early adopters of technology and had had really created a reliance on technology quicker than, than a lot of other businesses. Um, and so they had users that, that start, you know, the, the very first users that, that started to grow impatient with the systems because they couldn't get their job done without having someone there, you know, at a moment's notice to be able to fix the problems that they were having and get them back, you know, on task. And so, you know, healthcare even then was, was a big one. Um, you know, there, there, there were those, those percentage of, of healthcare operations that really worked to digitize, um, and, and used technology, um, you know, in the late 
90s ahead of a lot of other operations. But you, should be, you started to see this big boon around, um, you know, just the, the, the organizations where efficiencies were, were most easily created. So at that point, you know, professional services firms, um, you know, law firms, accounting firms uh, were, were some of the earliest adopters of that heavier technology. And, and 20 years later, we turn around and look at that and realize that, okay, now they're, they tend to be some of the laggards um, you know, because they adopted the technology and they would like it to generally stay the same because they're not in the business of changing their model year over year. Um, but in the er- early days, they, they, they were the ones that were uh, really driving a lot of that change. Are you guys a managed service provider? Or are you a technology company, consulting company? How do you how do you market yourself? Yeah, so we're uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. The, the managed service provider label um, certainly fits us on at least a significant portion of our business. But it also indicates a a, a cultural uh, definition that um, is ill-fitting at times. And so we we have a a managed service operation. We have an IT consulting operation. um, And those those teams work uh, closely together every day. So we have managed service clients that we're providing consulting services for. And we have clients that are separate uh, in that. But we basically look at at ourselves as, you know, and the, the, the platform IT provider. So whether you need, you know, strategy, whether you need, you know, someone to fix the printer, we're that group. Um, and all of your other IT related vendors, so your ISPs, you know, your, your copier vendors, your software uh, vendors all sit on top of, of the relationship that our clients have with Greystone. So we make sure nothing falls through the cracks. Um, and we're we're managing you know a lot of those relationships and the business outcomes for those things. So that's where the idea of of us as a managed service provider um, tends to be a little bit less common. Is that we're not just a help desk, you know, and you know, uh, you know, as or you know, support as needed. We're really driving a lot of the business case, business strategy, um, and that's become more and more prevalent over the years. Um, just as, as more businesses need to understand where to go in an increasingly complex technical world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, especially given the complexities of technology these days, people just want a turnkey solution partner that they can depend on and that they can trust. Yeah, and we found that uh, the, uh, my view is that technology um, used to be simple, um, but not very easy in the sense that every business had the same basic technology. It was, you have a Microsoft server or a bunch of Microsoft servers, and you have Windows desktops and, you know, occasionally laptops, but everything really ran in the same uh, ecosystem. Those were complex platforms. So you needed a, a department, you needed someone to make those things go. We've evolved to a place where um, it's, it, it, it's the opposite. Uh, IT is, is much easier. People coming into the workforce know how to run systems. They know how to they they can spin up a cloud service. Um, the the actual uh, you know services that that we're supporting um, have fewer complexities because so much of it is consolidated um, in a software as a service model or a cloud based model. But it's much more complex because you have thousands of options for what your platforms should be. Microsoft is still, you know, obviously very prevalent, but, you know, there's, there, there are different things, there are different things to put on top of that. Most, you know, technology these days is developed, you know, to be used inside of a, a browser. Um, but organizations need, need a much more, I mean, a much sharper IT strategy in order to to get something uh, unified and, and effective uh, for their teams. So we've we've had to shift a lot in terms of how we focus with our clients on decision making and what really makes sense for for their teams. The culture of Greystone, it sounds like it's very important to you. How do you go about building that culture, though? So yeah, that's that that's the. Uh, the multi-million dollar question. Um, and, uh, I've, literally, I think that, um, what we recognize in needing to be a people first organization and w- w- what we call ourselves is a, a context aware uh, technology service partner. So we, it's not 
just good enough that we're polite and people, um, you know, like talking to us because we're nice when, when we provide service. It's important to us that we have relationships uh, that allow people to want to talk to us, to give us more information about what's going on. You know, if, if you're comfortable talking with somebody else, you uh, oftentimes unknowingly share more details. You, know, you, you share more depth. And as IT people, that gives us more ability to uh, to solve deeper problems and to understand. You know, if, if people want to give us information, the more information we have, the better. We 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 have a saying that uh, you know, I, IT people are are great at solving problems and and terrible about knowing what problem to solve. And so th- our our shift to really change that um, starts with being able to build a team of of the right people. So we we hire differently. Um, but everything has to come down to what is the work experience like and, and what is the, the business culture and culture has become such a buzzword. Um, but for us, culture comes down to how deep is our company? Um, how deeply are we connected to each other and how deeply are we connected to our clients? And, you know, it's the, the idea of, you know, beer on Fridays and, you know, a foosball table and, and all of that, that's, that's entertainment. That's not culture to us. Um, so as you know over the years as as we've you know had our successes and failures with building this type of of culture um a, a few key themes have come out and one of them is that um people who who I mean, our best employees are our self accountable employees the ones who run faster because they you know w- when they're given freedom than they ever would if we were just having to push them and then to but we have to turn around and realize that if if we're going to give people autonomy to um to make decisions inside of our company kind of i mean at, at each level because they perform better that way then we need a mechanism to really understand that what's being communicated inside the company is truth so as a ceo you know, having 90 staff members that all have some level of autonomy, some level of decision-making uh, ability, um, and that that's where our, our success lies. We also have to make sure that, you know, if I'm going to steer the ship, I have to know where things are going and know where things are at. And that was a much bigger challenge than we ever realized um, it would be because in the early days, we felt like if if we had just honest intention to take care of people – that we that they would understand that and they would trust us and we and, and we could trust them and we would all you know live happily ever after and as we grew we we, we realized that there's so much about the employment culture just by default that pulls away from truth or or authenticity um, or the term that uh, that we use internally is psychological safety um, and it, it starts with the fact that even the employment process is all based on lies. So we have, you know, the, you have the, the resume, you have the job description, you have both sides of the interview table. Um, everybody's putting their best foot forward. Uh, and, and that will never change. Um, you know, we're, we're selling something at, at, at at that moment, but success in in you know deep cultures um, comes from actually connecting with people based on who they are as individuals for real, not just the facade, not just the you know the best side of me. Um, and so with that, we have to disrupt that because because the the common trajectory is that you show up for your first day at work. You show up for your your fifth year of work. You're still typically um, in a lot of cultures rewarded for showing what's going right and for you know hiding or pushing down you know or or candy coating what's going wrong. Um, but w- w- if we're going to have depth in in what we're doing, we can't afford to do that. We need to, we need people to be comfortable asking for help. We need to be people to be comfortable. Um, you know, sharing lessons learned, and so we we've built a system that, that it, 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 and values based on normalizing failure, celebrating success, 
and giving people you know connections and and you know, a, a safety net so that while they do have their autonomy, they know that we've got their back. They know that they can bring truthful information to us, to their team members, and we're all marching in the same direction. So, defeating a lot of that cultural competition that comes uh, you know in some of the tech uh, industries has been important to us. That obviously trickles down to your customers too, right? If your people feel empowered to share the good and the bad internally, then the customers benefit from that culture as well. Exactly. And um, it's funny because I don't think that we ever thought that it was very groundbreaking. But if you think about most technology companies, um, and, and specifically the sales aspects of technology companies, is you have someone goes, who goes and sells something. And whether it's service, whether it's a product, um, and then you've got a team behind, you know, behind them that's in charge of making those things happen. Um, and there's typically a big di- disconnect because the incentives aren't the same. And so we did something early on kind of out, out of, you know, it, it was more, it was an, an accident or maybe an experiment where we just said, all right, we need the person who's sitting there making that promise to be the one who's also in charge of delivering that promise. And because we're hiring people who connect with people anyway, you know, let's just get everybody involved in the sales process and let's get everybody involved in talking to, to their future customers during you know that process. And what we found was that the, the customers resonated so much with the idea that we weren't going to, you know, we we weren't going to have a bait and switch type uh, situation. We weren't just blowing smoke, um, but that we were actually starting to to provide value and consult even during that sales process. And it created a, you know a, an unfair advantage you know for us in the sales process because we had our delivery team out there starting to deliver you know value in conversations against you know uh, up against people who were just focused on numbers and a pretty proposal and that's been something you know, it's it's continued to be a big part of of what we do but it's also um you know, it's it's it, it, it's driven the the service culture as well to recognize that we we definitely set bold expectations we we want to promise big things but only the things that we know we that we will deliver on uh, on their behalf so let's back up a few years are you originally from colorado or transplant um so i, I moved here when i was in uh, elementary school my parents are natives so i kind of claim the native thing even though i was born when my dad was in med school in california um i definitely am not a californian so i have lived here uh, most of my life you know if you start a company when you're 20 years old you obviously have to have some uh, you know, some long standing entrepreneurial interests right was this your first go at a, <laughs> go at a entrepreneurship no i think it was um it, it was definitely my first successful go um it was probably maybe aside from you know the uh the concession stands at uh you know at various you know sporting events when I was in junior high and things like that that were were always fun uh, entrepreneurial endeavors but I definitely have always wanted to build things and building with people um, is is a really uh, fun combination to me but early on um, it was really a, a combination of that entrepreneurial spirit and not really wanting someone else to tell me what to do <laughs> so um, my dad and I joke a lot. He's, he's a college professor and, uh, um, we have four college degrees between the two of us and, and he, uh, <clears throat> and I quit a year in. Um, <laughs> and so, so it's, it, it's a fun, it's, it's definitely a much better and more positive d- uh, discussion, um, in our house these days or, it, you know, it, it, in our relative houses than it was when I, I quit school, uh, at 19, but, um, my parents always did a great job of, of pushing me towards what I was passionate about, even if it was a little bit ill-advised. Um, because at the, you know, in those, those early days, I think I, I, I was, I was 16 or 17 when I got my first IT job. 
I started a web development uh, company um, right before I graduated high school. Uh, I, I continued to do that while I was trying to go to college, um, and I was frankly just having more fun doing that. So I, in hindsight, I don't think I would make that decision that way again, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it to myself or to my kids um, because I think 19 times out of 20, it doesn't turn out you know, as beneficial you know, as it has these past 16 years. Um, but to, to say all, all of that, I think that it, it really was that entrepreneurial drive that pushed through a lot of those early years too, of realizing that, you know, when I was 20 and I had to make 500 bucks a month and I could work a hundred hours. Um, and there wasn't really much cost to that because I was, I was just loving it and loving life. Um, I, I certainly took advantage of that. Whereas I've watched people, you know, maybe start with a, a much better foundation educationally, financially. Um, but they're starting when they already have a lot of, of, uh, things, you know, families, uh, mortgages, things like that, that I just wasn't concerned about at that age. What was the technology community like when you started back in 2001? You mentioned the fact that we were coming out of this, um, the, 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 the dot-com bust. And so you had your technology lifers, um, which at that point, you know, it was very different because um, Windows, especially Windows 95, had really revolutionized um, a lot of how businesses uh, used technology. And that was only six years prior. So you had... Um, people who who were used to the the deeper technologies, the mainframe systems, the you know the the IBM uh, type systems that were um, you know really ingrained in in deeper aspects of business and and um, operations, uh, and then you had frankly the the people who were in my generation um, who had you know taken to using technology for the first time and just wanted to do something cool with it. And um, so it, it was a bit of a disconnect uh, because the, the, there was so much history that I just never knew. Um, but I didn't have to because of how the, the desktop changed that, uh, the, just the, the user uh, experience. So um, I, I would say that where the, the space that I was in was certainly less um, uh, entrepreneurial um, you know, and, and innovative uh, than what we see in a lot of the startup spaces now. And some of that may have been just the you know, people being gun shy uh, from those crashes you know, in their early 2000s and the fact that um, you know, you, the, the, the dot-com boom <laughs> um, you know, I think felt like a flash in the pan to a lot of people where I think as we turned around and we, we, we realized it was, you know, mismanagement of money and mismanagement of, you know, really misunderstandings about where, you know, the, the value was going to be driven. Um, but I like where, where the product development, um, you know, service development mindsets are now um, a lot more compared to those early days. So as you've grown the company, I mean, what's the biggest challenge, biggest obstacle you've had to overcome? I would say, say two things. One, uh, learning really early on that a growing company doesn't mean that we're rich. It means that we're poor. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking, you know, and when I saw these fast growing companies that, that, uh, that, that they had all kinds of money and then our employees, you know, as we were winning awards for our fast growth, um, would, would oftentimes assume the, the same things about us while, you know, we were just learning how to use our, our cash, um, and leverage it, you know, as best as we possibly could and taking home very little. And so, so that, that mindset, you know, was, was, was certainly, and just the math around it was something that we just had to learn and still have to, you know, pay very close, uh, attention to. But being a people first company in in the technology space and you know building a culture on you know the ability to to have candor and psychological safety um, and build trust in in an industry where trust is not prevalent um, presents challenges every week and we we've built an amazing team of people who recognize that in some ways we're doing things the hard way because setting up a tiered help desk and 
making everything very mechanical and focusing on just you know efficiency you know of of how fast we close a ticket um, and things like that. Bottle to run. And I I I don't like it. You know, our clients don't like it. It doesn't provide. It's it, it's not interesting to us as a team because we know that we can do things that are 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 far beyond what some of those traditional structures will do. But it's one thing to just say to ourselves and remind ourselves, hey, we're doing it the hard way. It's another thing to actually be in the middle of doing it the hard way and fatigued and thinking, is this really worth it? And there are times that we've realized that we've probably reinvented some wheels that we didn't need to reinvent. Um, but I think the, the aggregate of the decisions that we've made over time um, has really stood out to, to us you know, and the team that's, you know, that, that's been with us uh, through that. And as we continue, continue to add people, um, just that, that mindset you know, is the most important thing. But it's also the hard the hardest to find. Yeah, I can imagine the, <laughs> some of the challenges <laughs> I mean, making people feel, you've used this term a couple of times, psychologically safe, right? And just building that trust. Yep. Uh, I think that's something that not a lot of customer driven, you know, I'll, I'll use the model of, you know, of a, of a large consulting firm, right? Not really something that they're, that they're known for. Being able to build that instill that trust is, is remarkable. Yeah. The, the fun thing for us is that since we are a technology company, we have a development team. We use technology every day. We understand software. We've actually built a software platform, uh, fully web-based and, and app-based just for our internal team um, to make sure that we're, we're answering and asking the right questions and sharing the right information um, you know, on a consistent basis. And um, it's it's something that that most people don't ever get to see about our organization because it's not client facing, it's not market facing. But it's something where we we, we recognize that if we wanted to normalize um, failure and if we wanted to normalize constructive, honest feedback, that we had to take it out of you know a place of it being so emotionally connected, and so. We, you know, I recognize that if I walk into one of my team members and say, you need to change this, you know, or you need to fix this, or you need to stop doing this, the human response to that, the human nature is defensiveness. You know, if someone walks into me and says, you haven't responded to my email uh, since yesterday and I'm frustrated, I immediately throw up a wall and say, you know, the do you understand everything else I have on, on my plate? I, I, you know, and, but if someone were to ask me what's, you know, something I'm working to try to improve, it's the time it takes me to respond to my e emails. And so we've recognized the fact that if we can diffuse that by actually systemizing that feedback and making it so that not in an annual performance review, which I think is terrible, but in a way that, you know, we're just, we, we have consistency where it's very common for me to tell my team members, I need you to change this. And it's very common for them to tell me, I need you to support me better by doing this. Mm -hmm. And the practice that we grow over time and that we've been able to systemize to actually, you know, actually doing that inside of an app, um, it is, is a lot of fun. And it's been a great experiment that's allowed us to scale um, past that, you know, five person culture where we all just by default trust each other. So where do you draw this inspirational leadership from? You know, I, I think that uh, the, uh, as I grew up in the workforce and recognized what I wanted to see, um, I, I just had some great examples. Um, m my dad is, uh, a, a, a scientist um, and he's a research scientist and he's a teacher. Um, he, he hates business. He doesn't like it. He was frustrated. Yeah. I think he, he wanted me to go into science. And I remember him telling me at one point, he said that he was frustrated that, that so many of the smartest people go into business because that's where the money is. Um, and that was a big inspiration for me at the beginning to, to want to do something that was still focused around, um, uh, around creating something different, uh, doing something that hadn't be, be, uh, been done before. But my, my tendencies were in business. You know, the way that my mind works in terms of math and, you know, and economics and things like that, I, I was destined, you know, to, to be in this space. Um, but he was the one that just continued, continued to push me 
to think you know about the world differently and um, really you know understand that the best answers were the ones that you know oftentimes that weren't out there yet. Um, the uh, and then it, it's funny because my, my my both my parents are teachers. My, my dad teaches um, PhD level graduate students. My mom's a preschool teacher, and so just the 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 dichotomy of that and recognizing you know seeing what different workforces were like and what people really wanted um, you know differently in their their workplace um, was a big driver for me. Is this something that you kind of came into your own on as you were building the company or how, how has your leadership style evolved over the years? Um, you know, I think that it's, it's probably been created over the years. I think as a 20 year old, I was, I was not really focused on what leadership was at all. It was just how do we get things done? Um, I'm by default, I'm a poor micromanager and I don't say that, you know, as like a humble brag or anything like that. I'm just not good at the details of, telling somebody how they're supposed to get something done. And so I either need to be doing it or I need to let them do it the way they were going to do it. And that shifted a lot. Uh, you know, early in the early years, I would hire people and I would still just continue to do their jobs while they watched <laughs> because I was, I was so comfortable. I mean, that, that's where, where I knew success was. And so letting go of that and wrecking, you know, for me, wasn't about micromanaging them. It was about me stopping doing it. So I, I laugh because, um, you know, they, they don't let me touch the technology anymore. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, the, the, I, I, I love to build with that. You know, I, I loved technology you know, at the outset, but now it really is about enabling people to, uh, to do things. And honestly, that's still a constant challenge for me. You know, Jesse, my, my partner is my biggest advocate and also my, the person who pushes me most to let, let that go forget about it. Someone can do that better than you. Um, and, and recognizing that that's true and that that's great, um, is, has been a big, a, a, a big, uh, uh, evolution for me. And then the other side of it, or the, the other part of it is recognizing that I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did about how people, uh, uh, about what makes people tick and about what inspires them and what, you know, what makes them hide you know, their failures, um, you know, things like that. I was very naive at, at, at the beginning of the business thinking that if I just treated people well, they'll trust me, you know, and, and recognizing how complex that is and how much we have to be intentional about not just having our doors open as leaders and saying, come on in, but actually walking outside the door, going to somebody else's door and saying, you know, and, and asking the questions that need to be asked, you know, and, and, you know, taking it on ourselves to get to the bottom of situations rather than just waving the flag of I'm available if you need me. Obviously you're doing something right. Colorado Biz Mac named you CEO of the year finalist, XY, XYZ top five professionals, Denver Biz Journal 40 under 40, you know, 2020 visionaries. So you're attracting <laughs> the right interest, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. I think it's, it's one of those things that I, I, uh, um, we were, we're very flattered by, um, I, I'm very flattered by, and at the same time, um, you know, have to work to not get too hung up on because I think that especially those, those recognitions that are, are focused on, on, um, the innovation of, of what we're doing, we recognize that we're not done. And so if we were to stop here, you know, we, we've done some great things for some great, you know, for some great clients and great employees, but we haven't figured it all out yet. And so it's, uh, it's, we, we enjoy the, the recognition. Um, but we also have, a um, uh, it's just a, a, a conversation in our culture that the real difference is not made, you know, with the, the trophies and the, the, you know, plaques that we put on the, the, the wall, but I won't lie. It, it's, uh, it's certainly a, an ego boost and something that uh, helps, uh, especially those days. We, we had people in the early days that would just tell us that what we were trying to do was stupid. I mean, and they, and, and they were, were, they didn't mince words. It was the, you, you know, you can't grow this past 10 people. You can't grow this past 20 people. You can't grow this to $5 million. Um, you know, I, I had someone in a, um, that, that I, I, I respect a lot, still respect to this day, but in a CEO advisory group, when we were about three quarters of a million dollars, he told me, 
you will never run a $5 million company. Um, and I, I was just, you know, I was taken aback by it. And he said, you're, you're too focused on, on people as individuals. Um, and I remember thinking that, that there was a lot of wisdom in what he said that was actually very educational for me in terms of how I needed to look at, at people. But I also was and still am, am hell bent on making sure that we don't lose sight of that. So I, I, I had fun sending him a note, you know, a number of years back when we hit the $5 million mark in a year and <laughs> just say, thanks for pissing me off enough <laughs> <laughs> to, to say that, that this could be done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So last year you took on a two million dollar investment. So what big plans do you have for uh, you know for the future? Yeah. So that that was a big uh, learning experience for us too. Um, I w- w- we're doing things differently. Um, we we want we we view the business world differently than a lot of people in our space. So even though there's a lot of money flying around and a lot of of acquisitions happening, that that's never been for us. Um, because what we, we, we look at what we're doing and think, you know, I don't know that, it, that someone else is going to look at this and, and see it the same way that we do. And we don't want conflict on a board. We don't want conflict in ownership groups. We don't want to sell this to somebody who's going to not know what to do with it because of, of how we've built it. And we've actually had our employees in interviews say, I, I want to work here as long as you promise me that you're not selling this company anytime soon. Um, because they, they recognize that as soon as venture capital, as soon as you know private equity capital gets their hands on something, oftentimes it just becomes about what's showing on, on the P&L, you know, what's on the balance sheet and running a company based on, on paper. And so um, it, it was one of those things that it was a humbling experience to me to realize that there, there were investors out there who really cared about what, what we were doing and wanted us to do more of it. And so Cypress uh, Growth Capital um, is the group that uh, – invested in us in a non-royalty investment um, that gave us confidence to really um, really kind of corner the market when it came to to talent because IT and I mean technical talent right now is hard. hard it's hard to find and we recognize that we had an, an opportunity to, to be the place that people wanted to work um, who were the types of people that we knew could have success uh, in in our world, and we, and we by bootstrapping it, you know, hiring one at a time, you know, two at a time, just when when our team was stressed out, <laughs> when our um, you know when, when when capacity was was low and and people were at a breaking point, that wasn't a good sustainable model. So that's a lot of what we've worked um, through uh, with that investment is building you know, a team that you know, and, and hiring ahead for the next level of, of what we're doing. And it's, it's been great. You know, the, the types of organizations that we're, we're working with, um, you know, and then that are coming on board as clients of ours are uh, just, you know, they're, they're a lot like the organizations that we, we worked with in the past. Um, some of them are bigger, um, but their, the sophistication that we're able to provide to them just gives a new level of comfort. Um, so we've, we've really invested in people and then we've invested in our systems um, around that because we recognize that with the, with the economy of people, right? I mean, of talent right now is the clients, you know, need to follow the talent. And if we can be the best landing spot for both the clients and the people, then the growth gets to be pretty natural. And it's, we don't have to worry about, you know, it, you know, creating massive, you know, sales quotas or sales quotas at all. It's just about making sure that we're, we're utilizing the resources that we have because we know that we have an advantage over the rest of the, the market. So it's been fun to have a, a partner um, in the investment structure that understands that and that gets excited about that with us um, and that isn't there saying, all right, here's what you got to do and then you got to sell, you know, and this is what the paper says and all that because I think the real impact that we have to make over the next few years um, certainly is reflected in the financials, but it can't be driven by that. Yeah. So you guys started in Denver and now I see you have offices in uh, both Fort Collins and as well as Boulder, right? Yeah. So we uh, um, that that early IT job that I was talking about was 
Fort Collins. I, that's where I grew up. Um, that's where I met Jesse. Um, and after my wife and I had our second child, we decided we want, we wanted to raise our kids there. So the Fort Collins office was kind of an outgrowth of that. The idea that, um, I just, I wanted to, to be back home to where my family was. Um, but I, I love Denver and I don't really ever feel like I've left. I, I spend about half my week here. Um, and then the Boulder office, uh, was born when we recognized that, uh, um, we needed a home base for the team that was, that was hands-on with our, our clients there. Uh, we're, we're big on FaceTime, so it's important for us to have staff, um, that works in these areas and, and has a base to go back to. So as a young CEO, how did you learn to manage? Like, did you have mentors? Did you bring on executive coaches to kind of help you get better? You know, um, yeah. So the... Some of the best mentors that we had were um, people that we were managing that weren't happy with how we were doing it <laughs> um, in in some ways. Um, but so Jesse, my my business partner, um, was in college when I was in high school when we met, and so his business acumen has been has been big for me. But probably the mo- the biggest source of mentorship has been clients. Um, and the relationships that we've built with clients over the years. So when I was 20, you know, and 20, you know, 20, 21, 22, getting an audience with the CEO of a company that was well run and getting an audience with the CEO of a company that was struggling and being able to have some authentic conversations around that is, has probably been the most valuable thing in my career. Um, and, and a lot of our early clients are still the most important people in my business life. Um, and some of them in my personal life too. So, the we we've we've gone through various coaching things various training um you know leadership programs but the specific individuals that i can really attribute the mentorship to are ones that we were introduced through the services that we were providing yeah there's nobody no better person to tell you how you're doing than uh you know somebody who's paying your bills so it's true and and i learned real real quick that most ceos don't have a problem telling you what they really think and for you know, as off-putting as that was at times when I was young, it was also incredibly refreshing. There's there's a way to emulate that without you know falling into some of the CEO stereotypes that aren't necessarily beneficial. But uh, yeah, it's it was hugely uh, educational. For the past few years, we've seen a big technology surge in the state, right? People moving in for tech jobs, startups popping up all over the state. How has the technology ecosystem in Colorado really impacted your business? Do you have new competition? Do you have new partners, um, new people to turn to? How's that, how's that kind of affected you? Yeah, I think that it's affected us mostly in, in a very positive way. There's definitely a, a competition for, for technical talent. Um, but there's, there's also this growing dissatisfaction with, with some of these uh, more innovative firms and younger firms um, with the, the traditional IT model. And one of the things we talk about a lot is that IT is not a department a- anymore. If we're looking at IT as a department, we've, we, we've missed the boat because um, if, if your IT sits in the server room and not in the boardroom, then you're missing a competitive advantage, and and now you know c- continually, you know, continually also, um, you know, having a uh, uh, competitive deficiency. So what we've seen is a lot of of these these upstart companies who look at us and say, oh, we we have a culture that really you know mirrors a lot of the upstart culture, but we've been around for 17 years, 16 years. We know what business, how business has evolved, how technology has uh, evolved, but we live in their world. We can speak their language. So we get to work with some of the best, um, most innovative, most, you know, boldest, um, you know, people who, who are out there taking, taking the best risks because we're in some ways the anti-IT department. You know, we're not coming to them saying, here's how everything's going to be structured. We're coming to them saying, Let's figure out how you're going to leverage technology in a way that actually you know moves the needle for you, and 
Um, so being in the in, in the epicenter of of so much technical talent and growth and startup culture um, is something that you know, if if you talk to a lot of IT service providers, they'll look at it and say, well, startups aren't really a great um, they're not great clients when when they're established and they have money and they they know where they're going um, and we can just kind of you know fit in behind what they're doing and and coast to success then that's the kind of client we want. They probably wouldn't say that that, that way, but that's what, how a lot of the mentality develops. So for us to, to, to be at the forefront of that and, and um, you know, participate in startup culture without actually being a startup, is, it's, it, it's the best of a lot of worlds. So when you're hiring employees at Greystone, do you look more for the education that they have? Like, do you require a uh, college background or do you lean more on the, the tech skills that they have or the previous skills that they've acquired? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because neither of those um, is, is first and foremost for us. Um, I'd be a bit hypocritical if I, if I cared deeply about uh, college background. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I also, we also used to have a saying internally, like if, if someone said, Oh, I've got all these certifications, and we'd say, "Well, we we, we won't hold it against you." <laughs> um, and, and it wasn't specifically because we felt like that education was wrong. It was because um, off, oftentimes the te- the technology education tracks, whether it's in a a four year education, which when I was starting to do that, the technology maturity um, was was very very low, so um, it felt very worthless. Uh, or some of the the two year degrees, or or you know boot camps training programs, um, you know, certification schools, the, the challenge is that none of them teach creativity and creativity in every aspect of our technical world right now is important. And so if, if you're going to, going to basically tell someone you can have an $80,000 a year job by finishing this six month school. You're, you're setting them up for failure. And we, rec- you know, er, er, in the early years of Greystone, we would go to the tech schools and uh, ask who their brightest students were, and we would hire them. And then we would fire them. And then, you know, and after doing this a few times, we recognized that those students who excelled in those programs um, were fantastic at, you know, if you told them what to do, and said, do it a hundred times, they would do it a hundred times exactly right. But if you put them in an uncomfortable situation with a business executive who needed to get something done and said, make that person happy, solve the bigger problem, most of them didn't have any context for how to do that. So we employ more people at Greystone with psychology and sociology degrees than we do any sort of information uh, systems or specific technical degree. Really? And yeah, it's, it wasn't by, it, it, that, that wasn't on purpose. Um, but as we looked at it the other day, we were just talking about this and uh, it's, it's amazing to me that the, the people who, who have gone into um, programs that are based on how to connect with people better. And then they come out of those programs and they want to figure out how they can do that as, you know, and make the biggest impact possible that, combining these worlds drives so much value. And the, I, I fear a little bit for the education space because you have these, um, you know, the, the STEM programs, which I think are great. I, 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 I completely support that. I want more, um, you know, we, we, we talk, you know, openly about wanting to change, you know, the, the balance, the, the gender balance uh, in, in this space. You know, we work hard to, um, you know, to have a, a very balanced workforce, but I, w- I think our stats are something, you know, for, for our specifically IT jobs, it's I mean, fewer, far fewer than 10% of our applicants are female. And so if we look at, at where a lot of that has been perpetuated, you know, and created, it's this idea that these jobs are technical first and foremost. But no, you're hard pressed to find someone that has a glowing review of their IT person, whether they're, whether it's internal or outsourced, you just don't hear that. You know, I say, you know, if I go to a, uh, a networking event or, you know, or a banquet or some of the awards ceremonies and people ask what we do and we say, hey, we, we do IT services, which is typically the quickest way to get someone to not <laughs> keep talking to you at a doctor's right. party. 
So realizing that that's, that can't, we can't afford to be in, the, in an industry that looks at things that way and, we, and that has that reputation and, and that frankly deserves that reputation. So for us, hiring comes down to how do we I – mean, the, there's certainly an aptitude requirement. But I don't care what technology you know, uh, experience, some specific technology experience someone has five years ago because the technology is different. Um, I have enough people here who can install and support an Exchange server that, and no one is installing Exchange servers anymore. So I don't need to hire more people with that skill set. I need to hire people who can who can think on their feet um, and who can apply creativity to a technical area. And so we have to be very very selective. And um, we we have a. Uh, uh, one of the moves that we made with uh, after taking the the growth capital from Cyprus was we hired Sarah, um, our our director of people and culture, and she's she's our people focused HR person. And it's very rare in an organization that the most popular person in the company is the HR person. Yeah, that never happens. It doesn't, except here, and and, and it's one of my favorite things because her entire job is to get people in here that are like-minded in terms of our ability to create things, get people in here who, you know, can, you know, promote and enhance the diversity of who we are and how we think, and then make sure that they have what they need. Because as we're moving, you know, hundred miles an hour, it's easy to miss what people need. And to have someone like that who can really dig into these candidates, uh, you know, backgrounds and, and, and not just look at surface level. Do they have a degree, you know, or what, what skill sets do they put on their resume, but just truly who they are. I mean, who, who are they and, and how do they think um, is far more important to us. Like the employment rate here is like, I don't know, 2% or something ridiculous for yeah. the IT field. Yeah. Um, so have you experienced difficulties in finding uh, enough people to put through the screening process? You know, since, since we hired Sarah uh, last year, and really revamped our, our process for how we're connecting with people. We don't have the challenges that a lot of people do, um, but we don't take that for granted because that could change tomorrow. Um, it's all based on the fact that you mentioned, you know, sub 2% unemployment in IT. Um, and I don't want those 2%, you know, no offense to them, but they, sh they might want to find different careers. Um, so for us, it's, it's about how do, you know, for, for the portion of the 98%, which fits our model, and we, we hire fewer than 5% of the people who, who um, pursue working here. And we, uh, we have to be the primary place that they want to be. And that's hard when life here, you know, we, we, we push our, I mean, our, our employees get pushed to the limits of their psyches at times, you know, the self accountability autonomy, um, there, there's another side to that. So it's not perfect, but we're doing something that we really care about and we're doing something together. And as long as we can continue to do that, we're going to, we're going to be a landing spot for the right percentage of that 98% that isn't having their, their intrinsic needs met you know, sitting in a server room somewhere or just following specifically mechanical processes. So when we didn't have a very, you know, a very focused recruiting uh, path for those types of people, we, we did struggle because it was up to our team managers to, you know, in their quote unquote free time, which they didn't have <laughs> to, to try to make sure they were screening as best as possible and, and understanding as, as, as well as possible. But if I look at, you know, we, we've added, I think 27 staff members uh, this year, you know, in this, this big uh, um, growth push. And I couldn't be more excited about who they are. Um, it couldn't be some more excited about how excited they are coming into this. And so I'm less concerned about the, um, the statistics around that is making sure that the people who come in, who do have, the, the table stakes experience, you know, the ability to understand the, 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 the technical apt, aptitude and having demonstrated that in the past, that's just table stakes for, for what we're trying to, to do. But even, like I said, you know, f far more than, you know, far more of those applicants that, that, that have those qualifications still aren't qualified to work here. So we, we will continue to push um, hard to remain the place that the people who we want actually want to be here. 
Well, I wish you luck on that. Sounds like you've, you've created Thank you. you've created a place <laughs> that people you know really want to be. If you hire less than five percent of the applicants, you know. <laughs> and the, the people, the people that you yeah. bring on must be must be really top notch. So they, they are, and I think that's one of the things that you know we we've realized is really more in the twelve months than ever before. We are the absolute best place to to work for the people who should work here, and we have had some situations where we've to convince ourselves that we're the best place to work for everybody, especially when we, you know, went through some hiring challenges, you know, in, you know, prior to this last year. And that's a losing battle because we rec- you know, our, our culture is not a one size fits all, you know, just everybody show up and it's going to be a, a great time. It's for the people who care about what we're doing. There's really no place like it, but it's it out for something different than we're recognizing that uh, that it's it's um, foolish for us to, to to try to fit that um, you know or or cram that uh, together mm-hmm. too much. So I, I got to ask: sixteen years ago, would you do it again? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, I would do it again. If if I knew the outcome was here, then it, absolutely. I think I mentioned I I look back at some of the decisions I made and why I made them. People really liked. Uh, <laughs> You know, tout the college dropout. You know, makes good. You know, Mark Zuckerberg type uh, type story. That that wasn't this. I, I quit school because I was irresponsible and bored, um, not because I I was a visionary. Um, I, I I'm very fortunate and thankful for where I am. Um, I if I if I actually went through and mapped, knowing what I know now, I probably would not have taken that risk. Um, but I've also learned that. Uh, you know, if, if someone asked me, you know, it, what I want in the next five years, um, I don't even know how to answer that because every five year increment over the past 15, 16 years, I would have sold myself short because I didn't re- recognize what was even possible at those times. So that's, that's the, the exciting thing that I, I, I see now the, the world is very different in, in how I see it than it was back then. So I'm thankful for, for my naivety. You know, I'm thankful for some stupid decisions that I've made and, and thankful for the, the situations that put me in a place where I didn't really have anything to do but, or any other option than to, to prove that I could work my way out of it. You got a great story. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate you taking the time and, and, uh, and reaching out. It's the, the lifeblood of entrepreneurship in so many ways is sharing. Um, you know, I, I, I could listen to other, you know, founder stories, other entrepreneur stories, the successes and the failures, you know, as long as they're real, <laughs> um, all day long. And it's, it's one of the most educational things that, uh, that I have in, in my life. So, um, I, I appreciate you taking the time with me. Yeah, absolutely. So if people want to find more out about Greystone Technology, uh, how can they? Yeah, so um, greystonetech.com uh, is our website, G-R-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Um, but the, the, most important, the, the most effective way to, to find out about us is to talk to us. So we run a monthly uh, meetup in the evenings called Technology for Non-Technical Business Leaders. Um, and you can find out, out about that on our blog uh, or through Meetup. Um, we also run events around town with General Assembly, with some of the chambers of commerce. I'm just getting out there and, and talking a lot about uh, what we're seeing in, in the I- industry. So, um, and if, if nothing else, uh, 303-757-0779, the, the, the old-fashioned way um, of uh, just – you know, giving us a call, stopping by the office, meeting for coffee. Um, it's fun to have a team of, of, you know, nearly 90 people who are actually interested in having conversations with, with other people about what they do. So it's not just me. It's not just the leadership team. But, uh, you know, being able to, to engage really in all aspects of the, the business is something that we get excited about. Well, Peter, I want to thank you again for your time and for coming on Colorado Tech House. Thank you, sir. It's always interesting to hear the uh, you know the founder stories and people who started here and made it big. So I wish you guys <laughs> continued luck in, in the future, and uh, I hope to hear good things about Thanks. you. Thanks, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll tell you, when, I'll give you a call when we actually make it big. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Peter. I want this show to be relevant to you, so please send me your thoughts and suggestions. 
My email address is trapper at coloradotechcast.com. You can also hit me up on Twitter. The show handle is at cotechcast. I do read and respond to all messages, so, so drop me a line and let me know what you think. I'm always on the lookout for future guests, so if you know anyone with an interesting story to tell, or you yourself want to come on the show and talk about what you're building, then send me an email. Thanks for tuning in and join us next time when we bring you the story of another digital pioneer from Colorado. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Colorado Tech Cast with your host, Trapper Little. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you leave a review. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit coloradotechcast.com or on Twitter at CoTechCast. We'll catch you next time on the Colorado Tech Cast.